Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a man of the Jews, a leader. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him. And I'm going to tell you what this means in a minute, so I won't read it like Jesus would have said it, but he would have shouted it. Very truly, I say to you, it reads here, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without having been born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher in Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe... How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world in order that the world through him might be saved. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Good morning. This is a very familiar passage in that many of us in those memory verses Ron talked about learn when we were very young. We learned the verse if we went to church and Bible school, John 3.16. And if you're a football fan of the last few years and you watch that guy who painted himself with John 3.16, you at least probably looked it up even if you never read it in Sunday school. See what it says and what does it say? For God so loved Yeah, you're getting that. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And who did God love? The world. Who did God love? The world. It's something that we forget sometimes and think that God's love is for us. Back in the 60s, J.B. Phillips wrote a book called Your God is Too Small. It was great for its day. But it's a little bit dated today, and so I don't necessarily recommend that you read it, but I believe that the subject matter is worth considering again. Our God, very often, our concept, our understanding, the way we approach God is limited by our, our belief about who God is. And many of us fall into that category of deciding for ourselves who God is. And today, we're going to look at this passage and see if we can hear it again as if we were reading it for the first time. The man who came to Jesus, actually his name, if we looked in the Hebrew, his name is Nakademon. Nakademon. And there was a very prominent Jew who lived in the first century in Jerusalem, a Jerusalemite, a leader, who was named Nakademon ben Gurin. And that was, that was a well-known name throughout Jerusalem. Many people believe that this man who is written about in the, in the, in the books and the oral tradition as it was written down in the Mishnah and others' writings of that day, that this is the man that they're talking about, that he was this Nicodemus who came to Jesus. It says in John's Gospel that he was a leader, a ruler of the Jews. The word is ruler, which means he was a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the leading group in Jerusalem. 
This was not just anybody who came to Jesus. And to be a Pharisee and a leader among the Jews meant he was extremely well schooled in the law and the prophets and the wisdom literature. He knew the Jewish scripture, the Tanakh. He knew that scripture. He was familiar with it. Nicodemus would have prayed every day. He would have prayed on rising. He would have said his morning prayers, his afternoon prayers, his evening prayers. And he would have said the Shema again. The Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is one. Before going to bed six times every night, he would have said that as he did upon rising in the morning. This was a religious man. He was a man who was, com who was committed to the traditions, who knew the scripture, who prayed and sought a relationship with God. So when this man comes to Jesus, he recognizes who Jesus is. He said, teacher, rabbi, we know, speaking with not just me, but others in our group, we know that you are someone who comes from God, for no one could do the miracles you do unless God was with him. Now, if somebody said something like that to you, how would you respond? It, can you hear back here? Is it okay? Okay, good. Just check. It, it, if somebody said something like that to you, how would you respond? Well, I would say, well, thank you. That's a very nice thing to say. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus did not respond very nicely. In fact, he did the proverbial God in Nicodemus' face with what he said. And you can tell by Nicodemus' reaction that he is very affronted by Jesus' comment. That he doesn't like it. And he challenges it. And his, and his response is not very well thought out because it just kind of bursts forth as the first thing that comes to his mind. So what did Jesus say to him? The Greek words that he uses are Hebrew words actually as well. They're, they're in Greek, but they're also in Hebrew. Amen! Amen! And, and it's an affrontive statement. Amen! Amen! It's a shout. Listen to me, he said. Listen to me. You cannot recognize, see, observe, know God's kingdom unless you are born from above. And that would have been the way Jesus said that. Now, if I did that to you every day, it would probably make you uncomfortable every Sunday. Wouldn't it? I mean, I, I, I don't do that. Most pastors are wise enough not to do that all the time. And if you do it once in a while and get by with it, you're okay. But Jesus does that in this passage not just one time. Not just one time. Every time he answers Nicodemus in this passage, he starts out with this shouting phrase, Amen! Amen! It's, it's, a, it's an angry, frustrated, listen to me, you've got it wrong kind of phrase. And Nicodemus is defensive. The first thing Nicodemus says to Jesus is, how is that possible? Well, how is that possible? I'm supposed to be entered the second time into my mother's womb and be born. How can a man who's old do that? And he goes back at Jesus. And Jesus comes right back. Amen. Amen. And then he goes into a very long dialogue about Nicodemus and about the Judeans saying, you really can't see the kingdom of God unless it comes to you from above. Now, if you want a contrast for that, if you want to look at a contrast, look at Mac Matthew chapter 16. And look at the story of Simon Peter in that chapter. When Jesus takes his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi and he asks them the question, who do people say that I am? Well, they kind of stumble around with that. They look at each other and they say, one of them says, well, some say you're Jeremiah. So, some say you're... Um, one of the prophets, and then somebody else says, some say you are the one among the prophets. Some say you're Elias. Some say you're John the Baptist. Come back to life. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And everybody's silent except Simon. And Simon finally just blurts out, Simon the fisherman. He can be rough, but in this moment he speaks with a profoundness that rises from his soul. He says, you are Messiah. You are Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the one, the Son of God. And Jesus looks at Simon, and it's not a loud voice that speaks to Simon. 
He says, and you can almost feel the gentleness in what he says. May God bless you, Simon. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are Simon, son of the Spirit. Now, that's my translation, but I want to tell you why. Because Jesus uses a name for Simon that's only used in John in this place. You are Simon, son of Yonah. Not John, as it's translated in other places, but this place, son of Yonah, Jonah. And Jonah, in Hebrew, means the dove. The dove. You are a child of the dove. And as the dove descended upon Jesus as a sign that the Holy Spirit had descended, so Jesus was affirming that what Simon had just said didn't come out of his study, didn't come out of his being smart enough to get it out, but it came out of the mystery of being revealed to him from above by God. That's what he wants Nicodemus to know. And he's frustrated with Nicodemus, not because Nicodemus comes to him and flatters him and says, we know that you are someone who comes from God, for no one could do what you do unless God were with him. And Jesus wants Nicodemus to know that the kingdom of God is here. But he tells him, no one, no one may recognize, know, perceive. The word, the Greek word is blepo. And it literally means all three of those things. To see, to recognize, to perceive or understand. No one will be able to do that unless they are born from above. Unless God brings this knowledge to them. Now later on, Jesus is going to say to, to Nicodemus, he's going to say, well, let me tell you how it works, Nicodemus. The wind blows where it will and you hear the sound but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. In the last couple of weeks, most of us have learned more about tsunamis than we ever wanted to know. We've learned that they move across the ocean faster than a jet plane. We've seen the devastation in Japan on television. We've witnessed what happened in Hawaii and on the West Coast, and, and we have seen and watched with horror what has gone on in the devastation of the earth as it moved and as this water and this powerful surge of water blew in. We've seen devastations like that. But we've had our Katrinas. We've had our windstorms and our floods that followed it. The wind is a powerful thing. The earth has its power. Water has its power. And we may feel like we know about a lot about uh, air currents and that when the weatherman or weatherwoman gets on television and they explain to us how the cold front is moving in and it's encountering the warm front and we study how cold air and warm air come together and cause the storm and we know a little bit about that but in reality here's the reality even for us modern people who knew a lot more than the ancient people about the way the wind blows we still cannot control the wind the wind does what it does the earth does what it does. The seasons do what they do. We are not in control. Our mistake with God is to believe that we are in control. That we can control who God is by how we perceive or think about God. We cannot. One of the most affrontive statements that I remember out of the 1960s as a, as a student would be going to sit in, in sensitivity groups to discuss theology. We discussed a lot of things, but the statement that affronted me the most that I remember out of that time, and in those days I didn't know why it just was something that I rejected. Today I at least know why I rejected it. But it would be one of the pipe-smoking theologians of that day. It was a popular thing to do, who would sit back and blow smoke rings in the air and tell all of us young guys that 
my God would never act like that. And I can remember those statements. You may have heard that in Sunday school. We may have been guilty of making that at some point in time. But which of us would presume to know the mind of God and what God would or would not do? Listen to the arrogance in that. We in the church, not just First Methodist, but the church are an arrogant people. And it will be our downfall. And it was Nicodemus' arrogance that Jesus challenged that day. Nicodemus came and said, we've discussed it. We know that you are a teacher come from God. In other words, you are a kingdom teacher. And Jesus said, no, you don't. No, you don't. You cannot know it unless it comes to you from above. The crippling power that descends upon God's people is when we begin to consider that we are so knowledgeable, so knowing, so correct, that God could not work in any other way but the way that we see or think, or perceive. And some of our perceptions are wrong. How do we have a relationship with a God who is creator of the universe? How do we know a God who is so far above us that we cannot compare ourselves to this God? I'm glad that the choir sang Kyrie eleison today. There's a wonderful little story I know about that song. And it's about a monk who was wanting to build his relationship with God, but who had never been able to come into the presence of God. And he was from the city and had moved to the monastery and decided that he would go into the wilderness and he would literally stay in the wilderness until God came to him. And he would wait. And surely if he prayed the prayers and went through the motions that God would be commanded to come and that God would come to him. So he went into the wilderness and he prayed morning prayers. He was Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, so the morning prayers are long. And by the time he finished morning prayers, it was time for noonday prayers. And he prayed noonday prayers. And by the time he finished noonday prayers, it was time for afternoon prayers. And he prayed afternoon prayers. And by the time he was finished with afternoon prayers, he was so exhausted that he couldn't pray anymore and decided that he would look for a place to go to sleep. And so he found a place to go to sleep. But as he began to lie down in the twilight hours of the day, he heard sounds that he had not noticed before. Scampering, running through the bushes, little sounds out loud of feet moving and something growling or making sounds he didn't recognize and it frightened him. Being from the city, he'd never heard these sounds before. And so he couldn't sleep. And then he would see red eyes in the dark, eyes that stared at him red, and he would cry out in terror, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, all night long. That was his prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. In the morning, he was so weary, having not slept all night, having been up all night, he started down to the spring to get water. And when he did, he noticed in the edge of the water tracks of these creatures that had been there at night. It frightened him. And he cried out, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison. Nothing. Nothing would answer him. He stayed in the wilderness. You have to give him credit for that. He stayed in the wilderness and he became known as the monk of one prayer because the only thing he prayed was, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. And he would cry out that prayer. Some years later, years hear that, he's still in the wilderness. And one of his fellow monks finds him and has heard about him and asks him, are you the man that I knew, the one we now call the monk of one prayer? He said, I must be, for I only pray one prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. He said, did the Lord ever come to you? He said, oh, yes. One day when I wasn't expecting it, God came. And it was more amazing than I could ever have imagined. 
I could never have dreamed of such wonder. Well, he said, well, what do you pray now? He said, oh, I, I pray the same thing. Why? He said, because I've discovered that that's all I need. Lord, have mercy. God, have mercy. So how do we have a relationship with God? And it's wrapped up in this third chapter of John. Nicodemus has tried to go about it by his own power and his own strength, his own intellect. It can't be done. But it can be done when we recognize the mercy and the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. But the next verse is just as important as that one. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So what are some of those relationships that we form with God that are unhealthy? I want to give you just a few. One of them is God in a box. That's really the one we've been talking about. You can put God in an intellectual box. You can put God in an emotional box. You can put God in a this is what I believe and don't tell me anything else box. You can put God in a box of the past or God in a box of the future, depending on where you stand and all of that. But God doesn't fit in anybody's box. And the problem with boxes are we like to carry the box with us we like to put it in a safe place and take it out when we need it. We really don't want God loose and on the run. Some years ago, I took a group of teenagers to um, Parchment, and we did a, kind of a witness trip. We sang and did a worship for the prisoners at Parchment. It was back in the days when one of my good friends was a chaplain there, and he set it up for us. I don't know that you can do that anymore, but we did in those days. And so they were giving us a tour of the grounds. And one of the adults with us was from a large city in America and had never been out in the rural areas. And she and her husband had moved to Mississippi and were living in Jackson, and so it was new to her. And they were showing them the cattle, and then they were saying, this is where the bees are. And they pointed to the hives, and she said, the bees live in those, in those boxes? And... The man said, yes, the bees live in those boxes. And about that time, one flew in the window of the school bus that we were touring the grounds on. And she jumped up and screamed, somebody needs to do something. They've let those bees get out of those boxes. Now, most of us know that bees don't stay in the box. They fly out of the box. They go around that, they, that what bees do is gather honey and uh, gather pollen and bring it back to the box. But when we put God in a box and shut it up, it doesn't work for us. It doesn't work in our relationship with God. Tony alluded to this. We said it in the early service. When Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem, while the people considered that it would be a house for God's presence, Solomon proclaimed the truth. He said, The highest heavens cannot contain you, O God, much less this house made with hand. You see, the problem with the box is it's really idolatry. It's really a God that we create and mold in our image rather than being children of the Spirit with letting the wind blow where it will. And the wind is a powerful thing and letting it bring to us that truth. We bring to the box the truths that we want and put them in and close up the lid. So maybe we need to open the box today to take the lid off to look again, to see what it is that God wants us to know. Well, what other images of God are devastating for us in our time? Some of us would like for God to be like the proverbial gatekeeper in the gated community. Now, we don't have a lot of gated communities in, in Columbus, but if you go to Annandale Golf Course or Old Waverly Golf Course, you have to stop by the gate and tell the man at the gate who you are and why you're there before you can get in. It's just the way it is. It's a gated community, and there's a gatekeeper. And some of us would like for God to be our proverbial gatekeeper, to be the one who makes sure that nothing bad ever happens to us, stands by the gate, makes sure that everything is all right, 
And, and that works for a lot of people in America. Because despite 9-11 and despite Katrina and despite the devastations that have taken place in other parts of the world, we have it pretty good. Our lives are secure. Our lives have been secure. And though, even though the ups and downs of the markets and the other things have made us wonder at times, we still have it well. In fact, someone said that the wealthy in this world can be described by one thing. If you can make a decision standing at a hamburger stand between having a hamburger or a hot dog, you are among the wealthiest 3% of this planet. Because most of the planet cannot make that decision. They don't have the resources to make it. They are poor. We have it pretty well. We are well off. And so it makes sense for a lot of people for God simply to be the kind of gatekeeper for the gated community that we live in. Make sure nothing happens to us. Some of you are old enough to remember that country western quasi gospel song. I didn't, never thought it was a gospel song, but um, a lot of people did. Uh, why me, Lord? You know, our, our song really ought to be why not me. Not why me, but things happen. And the promise is, is that God is with us is not that nothing is ever going to happen to you. Young people, if anybody tells you that, that if you trust Christ in your life, everything's going to work out, it is a lie. And I'm here to tell you it's a lie. It is a lie. Sooner or later, you will have difficulty. You will have problems. You will struggle in your life. Everybody does. So what difference does it make to have Christ in our life? What difference does it make if the Spirit of God fills our life and the reality suddenly comes true that God promises that no matter what happens to us in this life, no matter what life brings to us, no matter what powers, principalities, height, depth, anything else brings to us. Tsunamis, hurricanes, tornadoes, disease, it doesn't matter. I will be with you always, Jesus said, and the difference is, is that when God is with us, nothing, Paul writes, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus the Lord. That is the power of God's presence, that even if we die, yet shall we live again. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's power. That's the strength of God's presence and God's promise. So, to put God as simply the gatekeeper in our lives is going to be disappointing to us. A a after a while, we're going to say, Lord, why would you let this happen to me? I didn't do anything. I, I, I behaved myself inside this gate. I remember some years ago, one of the young families that I, I knew went through a great crisis. And, and the woman had been very faithful in church, and she had worked hard, and she had taught Bible study groups and everything else. And and I remember the disappointment on her face when she said, I don't understand why this happened to me. I did everything right. That's not the question. Our relationship with God is not about just getting it right. The Pharisees certainly could lay claim to that. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. No, God's not our gatekeeper. God is more than that. So suppose we invite God into our lives. And here's number three. God's not. We can't put God in a box. God is not our gatekeeper. Neither is God just a guest in our home. M most of us are more comfortable with God being a guest, after all, especially if we've got a mother-in-law cottage that we can put God in. That's, that's much more comfortable. Okay, we're through with dinner now. Run on out to your cottage, honey, and I'll see you in the morning. You know, that's kind of the way we like to look at that. It makes us it easy. But having guests in your home is a little bit of a problem, isn't it? I mean, we love to have guests, but not all the time. We're glad, to, we're glad for them to go home. And one of the favorite expressions sometimes of grandparents is, I was glad to see the lights coming. I'm glad to see the taillights going. You know, they say that. And it's because you're, you're just not, you're used to your own stuff, your own home. And we get accustomed to the way we do things. So to invite God in as a guest, every once in a while, some of us are going to want to say to God, well, you just overstayed your welcome. You know, you need to go on about your business now and let me get on with mine because that's what we expect guests to do. And if our invitation to God is come in 
and be there, but go on back to your room, and I'll see you every once in a while. We are going to be miserable with that relationship. We are. And plus, God's not going to like it either. No, here's the truth. God doesn't want to be a guest in your house. God wants to be a resident permanently. But wait a minute. God doesn't just want to be a resident, a permanent resident. God wants to be the president. Or as Mr. Joe says every once in a while, the commander-in-chief. That's what he wants to be. The one who calls the shots. You don't get to call the shots. I don't get to call the shots. We enter into a relationship with God which is trusting and submissive and suddenly our lives are directed. How many times I can think that I've prayed, oh God, I'll do anything you want me to do except, and I named what I didn't want to do, and guess what God wanted me to do? Come on. The thing I said I wouldn't do. In fact, I told God several times in my life, I'll do anything except. And guess what I ended up doing? What I said I wouldn't do. Because that was where God needed me, wanted me to be. There have been times when I pass by people and the Lord says, say, stop and talk to that person. Now, how does God say that? I know some of you are thinking, how does God speak to you? I just feel like, you know, I need to stop and speak to that person. It's a normal human act of loving kindness to do. And, and I don't believe there are any accidents. So when you feel that, when you think that, when it occurs to you, why not do it? It's too great a risk not to. And yet there have been so many times I've said, I don't want to do that. I don't have time. If I stop and talk to that person now, they'll keep me here forever. I'd just like to go on. And guess what? When I would be obedient to what God would say, I would find out it was not about what I was going to say to that person, but what they would say to me that mattered. That's the way God works. But I limit God, and so do you, when we make God less than the leader, there was a cute song um, back in the 70s that some of the teenagers sang about, I've been riding in the front seat and put God in the back seat. And now I'm riding in the back seat and leaving all the driving to the chief. God wants to guide us not to be in control and manipulative and treat us like puppets on a string, but out of a relationship of one who truly knows and who truly sees. And God wants you and me to see. Does being a resident in our life or commander-in-chief means that God micromanages every part of our life? Absolutely not. No, in fact, the very opposite is true. God doesn't interrupt us very much. But if we don't anticipate the divine interruption once in a while, if we don't prepare for it, we'll never see it. It just won't happen. So we must prepare for it. I still love that prayer George Washington Carver prayed. It would be a good one for all of us to pray every day. He would get up and say, Lord, what do you have for you and me to do today? 